so in this video we're going to create a health text to appear above players or enemies whenever they take damage. So that means we're going to need to set up a game object for the basic text. We'll be using the built-in text mesh pro package in order to create our text prefab. The text is going to float upwards above the player, disappear after a certain period of time, and then remove itself from the game when the fade to completely transparent is done. And we'll be using the M5X7 font that we installed at the beginning of the course. But the interesting bit in this video is going to be that we want to create the text as an instance whenever a character takes damage. So we'll be creating a new Unity event that will happen when any damageable component takes damage. And we'll be responding to that with a custom UI manager. So let's start by creating our text prefab. So I'm going to right click in our scene hierarchy and go down to UI and then text text mesh pro. When we do this, we're using text mesh pro for the first time. So we need to import the text mesh pro into the project. So you'll have to go ahead and click on the button here, import TMP essentials, and then we'll add a folder text mesh pro to the root of the assets. So exit out of that and then double click on text TMP, and we'll be able to see our text on the canvas. So keep zooming out and you'll see the frame of the game canvas. I'm going to take the position X and position Y and set those to zero for now. When we actually spawn the text, we'll be creating a custom location for it. Where we have the text field, I'm going to put in a placeholder text like damage. So this should never actually be visible. Instead, we're going to replace this with the exact number of damage that a player or enemy is taking whenever we create an instance of the text. Next, we need to create our new custom font asset. So in the root of our project, go to UI, fonts, so right click on M5X7 and then go to create, look for text mesh pro and then choose font asset. So that will create the M5X7 SDF and we want to take that and apply it into our text TMP object. So click on text TMP and where we have font asset, drag in the SDF into this font asset slot and you should see the displaying font go ahead and change. So now we have a cool pixel art font to go with our game. For the font size, we'll leave that alone for right now, but let's change the alignment to the center. So when we create the text above our player, the text should center on the player, half to the left and half to the right. If you'd like, you can also put it to center vertically. So if we go ahead and hit play now, then you'll see that this text just shows on the screen in the center. So one of the differences between a canvas UI element and the actual game objects in the scene is that the position of a canvas element is static. It's not gonna change and move around on the screen. So the next thing we can do with this text game object is create a health text component. Before we do that, let's create a new folder and UI for text items. So I'm gonna create a folder, text, go into here. So before we create this as a prefab, let's rename this to be damage text. And in the text folder, I'm just gonna drag and drop it into there so we can recreate a copy of this. Also, one last thing I want to do, I jump into the prefab for it, and let's take the color of the damage text and make it red. So that will make it really obvious that when this number shows up on the screen in this color, that our character is taking damage. Then if we double click on the prefab, we can just make sure it's still there. So let's add the new component. I'll call this health text because we'll use it both for damaging text and healing text as well. The difference would be that we change the color here for healing, but we don't need to change that on the script itself. The script is going to do different things. So let's create the health text script. So in the root of the project, I'm going to take the health text script and move it into the scripts folder as well. So now let's open up the health text script for editing. So inside of the health text, we're going to create a move speed vector. I'm just going to make it a vector three and let's call it move speed. And we'll make this equal to vector three dot up by default. So this should be one on the Y axis, zero on X and zero on the Z axis, which means it's just going to be moving up on the screen. So then we need our update function. So with this move speed vector, we're actually going to apply it to a rect transform, not a normal transform because this is a UI element. So if we take a look at the damage text, you'll see it has a rect transform. So we need to move its position upwards based on our speed. So to do that, we'll need a rect transform. I'll call it text transform. Let's do a void awake to get text transform equals get component rect transform. And now on update, we want to take that transform, transform dot position, and then we want to add move speed times time dot delta time to it. 
So we're just applying a percentage of our move speed to the position on every second. So the time dot delta time makes it so that we can move at a consistent amount. So let's go back out to the game, hit play, and see if we get any movement on the text. So I don't really see any, but you can see that the number is going up over here on the position Y. So it is moving technically, it's just very slow. So let's try taking the move speed, and I'll set it to 50 by default. Let's hit play now. And you can see that that is a much, much faster float upwards. So I think the number we kind of want is probably going for about 75. I'll hit play. And yeah, I think after about one second, having that fade out, would be good. So back in the health text, I'm going to actually change vector 3 dot up to a new vector 3. And let's just use 0, 75, 0 as the default amounts. So I think this comes out to be a pixels per second, since when you move the position X and position Y on a rec transform, that's dealing in pixel amounts. So now we have two options for what we could do with this text component. One would be to reuse in our state machine scripts the fade remove behavior. Or another option would be to recreate basically the same information on the health text. In order to use the state behaviors, though, we would have to create an animator, an animator controller. And that might just be a little bit too much extra stuff. So I suppose I'll just create a really quick timer on the health text script as well. So let's edit the script. And we can put in a public float time to fade. And I'll default this to one second. So then we need a private float time elapsed and we're going to be fading out the color on the text mesh pro UGUI uh, component. So let's get that text mesh pro UGUI. I guess we can call it text mesh pro uh, for the variable name because TMP would just kind of mean more like temporary file and that doesn't exactly make a lot of sense. So let's get that component as well. I'll just hit tab and have that autofill. So on update, we'll do time elapsed plus equals time dot delta time. Let's make sure up here that we default time elapsed to 0f. And then if time elapsed is less than time to fade, then we're going to adjust the color on the text mesh pro. So text mesh pro dot color equals a new color. And let's base this on the starting values so that we don't have to get this every time. So we'll have a private color start color. Kind of like in our fade remove behavior. So start color equals text mesh pro dot color. So this is the starting value. And then this will be the updated value. So for the RGB, I want to keep that the same. So start color dot, let's see, R start color dot G start color dot B for blue. And then a new value fade alpha. So the alpha is going to be a float value, and we're going to calculate that. I'll just go over to the fade remove behavior, double click into it, and let's just grab this same formula here. The new alpha is equal to the start color dot A, the original alpha, multiplied by one minus basically a percentage calculation between the time elapsed and fade time. So if we just copy that bit over here, paste it in there, then we have our new fade alpha. So the only thing we need to change it over here is using time to fade as the variable name. And that should be it for the fading. But after the fade is complete, we want to remove our object from the game scene. So else, implying that the time elapsed is already greater than the fade, we're going to destroy the game object. So let's go back to Unity, hit play, and watch our fade. So you can see it fades completely and deletes itself from the scene. Watch the damage text in the hierarchy, and you'll see it removes itself when the fade is complete as well. So now all we need to do is have a Unity event where we create the health text and then assign a text number to it. And the fade out and the removal of the game object will already occur in the health text script. Another quick thing to note, this event system game object that gets created when you add a canvas to your scene, because we're using the new import system, we want to click replace with import system UI module here so that we're using the new updated version of the import system. OK, so let's create a new game object in the scene, and this will be our first kind of manager script. So I'm going to right click, create a new empty game object, and I'm going to call this UI manager. I'll reset all the positions to zero for XYZ, though it's not going to matter. And then I'm going to create a new folder in assets. So let's right click in the assets folder, create folder. And I'll call this managers, double click into here and drag UI manager into the slot. 
So the UI manager, I'm going to jump into the prefab for it. We're going to create a new script and I will call this UI manager, create an add. And once again, I'm going to move the script into the scripts folder inside of Unity so that it keeps track of where the scripts are located for the uh, game objects that already have components like UI manager attached. Okay, so when we move it like this, it doesn't lose the reference up here. Okay, then we want to add it into the script. And let's create a game object public field. So game public game object. And I'll call this damage text. We'll also have a slot for a health text. So public game object health text. I'll also say prefab at the end because what we're implying here is that we're going to create instances of these. So let's delete, start, and update. So I'm going to create two functions here that we're eventually going to use in a Unity event. So let's do public void, and I'll call this character took damage. So for the parameters, we'll do game object character, and then int damage received. Then I'll also have a function character healed. And let's do game object character, int health restored. So this will be a to-do. We'll come back to that a little bit later. So when the character takes damage, we want to create the text at the location where the character gets hit. So to do that, we need to find the spawn position. And that's going to be using a function on the camera. So camera.main, which is your active camera. And we're going to do world to screen point, which means we take the world position of the character and we turn that into a point on the canvas, something that the rect transform can understand. So when you want to turn something from a world position into a canvas position, you use world to screen point. And then you need the position we're taking from the world to turn into a screen position. So that's going to be character.transform.position. Then we're going to want to instantiate a copy of our prefab, and we're going to set the text on it. So to set the text on a text mesh pro, we can get TMP underscore text, and I'll just call this uh, TMP text, I guess, equals, and we're going to instantiate a copy of our damage text. So damage text, the location where we're spawning it is this spawn position, which we just calculated. The rotation is going to be cartonian dot identity. And then the parent is going to be the canvas, which we have not gotten. So, and then the parent, which we're attaching it to, is going to be the canvas game object. So we'll need a reference up here to the game canvas. So public canvas game canvas. And for the instantiate, we'll do game game canvas dot transform. So the last thing we want to do, this gives us a copy of our game object. So when we have the game object, we want to get the TMP text component. So get component TMP text. I can make this uh, two lines if that helps. And then we want to set the text on the TMP text to the damage we received. So TMP text dot text equals damage received dot to string because we need to turn an integer into a string so that we can assign the string to the text. OK, so. Honestly, we can just copy paste this down here for the character healed function, except that we're going to use the health text prefab. So copy paste that down there. And instead of damage received, it's health restored. So copy paste. And there's our healed function, which will respond to one event and the character took damage, which will respond to another event. So to get the game canvas, when our script starts, we can do void awake and we'll do game canvas equals find object of type canvas. So that will look in the root of our scene, the game level, and find the first object that is of type canvas. As long as you only have one canvas to find and that's in the root, it should go ahead and find it. And then we'll use that for uh, creating the text into for the uh, parent transform. So when you have a UI element, you should create it and assign it onto the canvas because it's a UI element. So we have the methods to invoke on our UI manager when a character takes damage or when it's healed, but we don't have those Unity events. Now, before what we were doing with the damageable component is we created a Unity event straight on the damageable component. And then other scripts inside of the same game object, we drag and dropped onto the inspector, which function we wanted to call. But in this case, the UI manager and the damageable characters exist as two completely separate entities. And we might even have damageable characters that spawn after the game loads. So we can't actually set those Unity events up in the inspector. Instead, what we're going to do is create more like a global Unity event, a static Unity event, one component, the damageable, call that event with the dot invoke, but we'll subscribe to it inside of the UI manager when the UI manager 
is a awoken in the scene or either awake or on start. So let's create a new folder in our scripts. I'm going to right click over here, add new folder, and let's call this events. Right click inside of here, add a new item. And this is going to be a C sharp class. So I'll just call this character events.cs. I'm going to get rid of the namespace. I'll change from internal class to public class. Let's get rid of that and just align everything like you would normally. And inside of here, we're going to create a public static unity event. And this will be character took damage. And then the name of this event will be character damaged. For the parameters over here, I'm going to add in game object and int. So the object that took damage and the amount of damage it took. And let's also create the character healed event. So character healed, which is going to take basically the same parameters. Character healed and amount healed. Okay, so now that we have these events, we can invoke them inside of our damageable script. So let's go to damageable. Scroll down to where we get hit, which is on this uh, hit function. So after we've already checked that it's not invincible, we're taking the damage, right? And that is where we should call the unity event. So I'm going to do it right after we call the local damageable event, which was more to let other components know for physics reasons. And let's do character events. So we've got the class name here. And we're accessing a static field, which is uh, character damaged. And we need to pass in the game object. So that's the game object of the damageable component. And then we need the amount of damage, which is just damage. Okay, and actually I forgot the dot invoke with these parameters. So character events dot character damaged, the name of the event, dot invoke to call the event, trigger it, and then the parameters we're passing in. So anything that now subscribes to this event can be notified with this information. And we don't actually need to know anything about the damageable component. We just need to be notified that this event happened. So now we go back to character manager and let's add in the trigger so that we can run this character took damage function. So uh, let's do character events up here dot character damaged and we'll add a delegate method to it character took damage. So character events dot character damaged and we'll do add listener and we need the name of the method we're going to call which is character took damage. Okay, just make sure we spell that correctly. So it just needs to be the name of the method and the parameters will just come in automatically. So let's do this again with character healed just in advance. So character events dot character healed dot add listener character healed the local method. And now these functions will run when these events are invoked. Now there is a chance that the UI manager would be disabled in the scene or removed from the scene. So I'm actually going to bring in a couple more lifecycle methods. So we're going to have void on enable which is going to mean whenever this UI manager is made active in the scene. And then down here, we're also going to have private void on disable. So the reverse of it. So let's take these add listeners and bring those down to on enable. So awake only happens once on enable can happen multiple times. And we want to make sure that we're only listening for these methods to call when our UI manager is actually active. So in reverse, we also want to remove the listeners when our script is disabled. And all we need to do is change add listener to remove listener. So I'll copy paste that, copy paste that down there. And now our UI manager should be properly subscribed to these events and can respond to them in our game whenever they need to. Okay, so back in the Unity game, let's remove this example damage text from the scene. I'm gonna just delete it. And we already know that our characters can take damage. So I'm going to go into play mode and we'll try taking damage from the knight and hitting the knight to deal damage to it. So let's hit play. And uh, currently we can see that it's not triggering yet. So let's see what the error is. Object reference not set. Ah, of course. So let's go to the prefab for the UI manager. We have to set the damage prefab and the health prefab. So let's open UI text drag the damage text into here. I'm also going to create a copy of this prefab, Control-V, to copy our damage text. And then we can rename this new prefab to be health text. I'm going to double click into it, and we'll just change the color to green. And that's all we need to do for some health text. So now the UI manager, we want to bring in the health text over here. Let's click the three dots for the UI manager script and apply this to the prefab. 
Now when we hit play, let's see if it works now. Okay. So, still not. It is finding the canvas, so that's not the problem. Let's double click into the script and see what the issue is. Okay, so my bad. The reason here is actually that Unity events have to have some kind of uh, component mono behavior game object attached to them. So what we really want to use for character events is uh, Unity action. So this is almost the same thing, but you can't set these in the inspector. You have to set these uh, inside of code directly. So if we go to UI manager, you'll see that add listener errors out. Instead of add listener, you want plus equals the name of the method. And we'll do that down here as well. But just FYI, if you do have a Unity event on a mono behavior, not a class that just contains static fields like this, then add listener and remove listener will work the same way that doing plus equals or minus equals on a Unity action will. The main difference between the Unity action and the Unity event is that the Unity action, you have to subscribe and code directly like this. You can't drag and drop in the inspector and a unity action would not show up in the inspector for that matter okay so aside from this change everything else should be the same so let's go back to the game hit play and see if our text actually works here okay so yeah i can see the players getting hit for 10 damage the text is a little small but it's definitely working let's swing at the knight and there we have damage text for the knight the only problem is the text is kind of small so we can fix that quite easily we'll just click on the prefab in the project change the font size let's just make it something like 72 and i'll make that 72 for the damage text and the health text now let's hit play get hit and we can see that's much bigger now so now we have damage text that's going to float away and remove itself from the game uh, after it has been there for a second and what's really interesting about all of this is that our UI manager doesn't need to know anything about the damageable components. We're just responding to the Unity action. And the damageable component doesn't need to know anything about the UI manager. It just needs to know to invoke the event so that other things like the UI manager can respond to it.